And hello everyone and welcome to our meeting today. Once again, we come to you via this network and this broadcast from the Church on the Rock. And today we're here once again to review and to study the book, Breaking the Silence, written by Pastor Fred Sully, the senior pastor of the Church on the Rock. And we'd like to welcome all our viewers, our members, and our friends uh, around the world who are watching this program today, or perhaps in our future archive programs in YouTube under the Church on the Rock. As I've said always, uh, we have this book available. If you would like to have a copy of this book, you can contact us on the uh, screen. You would see information, our website, our email, our phone number, that you can contact us and order the book or the PDF version as well. So we like to encourage each and every one of you to uh, look at this book, Breaking the Silence, and make sure that you have placed your order so that you can study the book with us as we go through chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph, and study a very, very vital and important truth in the Word of God. The entire Bible uh, has in its fabric this truth of God's sovereignty, absolute sovereignty. We call it the kingdom of God. And how do we relate to that kingdom and the principles that govern that kingdom, i.e. the principle of the altar and the principle of the remnant that are the key factors that govern the workings of the kingdom of God in the lives of God's children and believers. So without any further delay, before we actually get into the study, I'm going to welcome our pastor, Pastor Fred. Welcome to Thank you. our uh, meeting again today. Thank you. As you know, we're about to study chapter 13 today. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a quick review of 12, but we'll go to chapter 13. But before we pray and we start, uh, if you have any particular word that you'd like to address to our viewers, please do so. As usual, I want to thank you for being able to be in this ministry and also have the opportunity to speak to our brothers and sisters. As I've always said, <clears throat> our goal is to edify our brothers and sisters together. We allow God to work in our lives, to accomplish His purpose, to bring us into a deeper knowledge of Himself. And I pray that every word we speak will edify, will strengthen our brothers so uh, that uh, we will be faithful to the call that God has given to us individually and to this ministry. Amen. So with your permission, we'll have a word of Please. prayer. And then after that, we'll have a quick review of chapter 12. And then we'll start on chapter 13. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that you've allowed us to be in this meeting, uh, even though it is coming through a broadcast. And yet all your children around the world, those who will be watching even as this moment, or later on in our archive programs, I pray that you bless everyone. You speak to our hearts, you reveal your mind to us, you bring us into a conviction that we need to know you and to be able to stand for you. Today we pray a blessing on the material that we are uh, discussing and uh, talking about so that it may truly be edifying each and every one of us. We thank you for this opportunity. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Fred, last time uh, we studied chapter 12, which was uh, the preparation uh, or preparing the remnant. And we were looking at the life of Elijah the Tishbite as to how he represented the truth of what a remnant believer is all about. And there are six points here that are mentioned about Elijah. I just want to quickly name them so that our viewers would remain, remember, and it'll be a reminder as to what it is that Elijah stood for or did that represents the principle of a remnant believer. So the first one uh, that you wrote here in chapter 12 is that uh, Elijah stood before the living God. He told Ahab, I, uh, by the living God that I stand before him. So uh, he had a, a particular relationship that he was standing uh, for God and with God. And the next point that you covered was he identified uh, himself with the uh, Lord in prayer. He spent time in prayer. We don't just call ourselves a remnant unless there's a lot of prayer behind it, both individually and corporately. 
The third thing that you mentioned there is the fact that he refused the glory of the flesh. There was many uh, temptations, perhaps, or offers for Elijah to uh, compromise or to take a little bit of glory to himself, and yet he refused to do that, basically. Now, by the way, before you go to <coughs> the point four, five, six, I want to mention something. Yes. Yes, we're uh, looking at the life of Elijah and all those points that uh, made him who he was. Was it only for Elijah? No, I said this or, is for or, all... Or was it written for us everyone. to be an example no. that we need to be stand before God? We need to uh, uh, actually... Identify prayer, in prayer, yes. Prayer and, uh, and... Refuse the glory of the flesh. Refuse the glory of the flesh. Yes. It's very important that we see what God did with Elijah to train him for a final confrontation. Yeah, he's a representative of yeah. the principle of the remnant. Yes. Number four, he relied on the promise of God's providence. And we talked about how in one of the most unusual and unnatural and impossible situations, God took care of Elijah because he was standing on the principle of, of the nonconformity for the interests of God. Number five, you mentioned that he obeyed it by abolishing the religious background. He wasn't interested in playing church game. He wasn't interested in playing the religious game. He was only interested in one thing. Is God's interest protected? Is God's interest declared? Is God sovereign over his affairs? Or are we trying to put God in a box? Call it a church. Call it a denomination. Call it an organization. Call it Christianity. Call it churchianity. He wasn't interested in that. All he wanted to know is God sovereign over his people or not. And the last point that you mentioned in point number six is he took time to receive further light. In other words, once in a while he would take a step and God would say, go backwards. You're going to wait a little longer. You're going to get more instruction, more light. So I guess the life of a remnant believer is never a uh, one-sided or one-dimensional life. From time to time, God says, step aside. Take a break. I want to talk to you. I want to train you further, as we see in the life of other yes. heroes of faith as well. Yes, very good. So with this in mind, we now go to uh, chapter 13, which is knowing the character of God. God's chosen remnant may not be very visible and prominent, but they are always being prepared and trained for a final showdown. So was the case with Elijah, with whose knowledge of God had to be enlarged through a test of faith. Each step he took brought him into a deeper knowledge of God, which in turn led him to a greater exercise of faith. In line with this stage of his life, we come across uh, another change in Elijah's circumstances. Uh, I think we have a series in knowing God. Yes. We cannot trust anyone, even God, if we don't know him. That's right. And it is through circumstances, as you mentioned, stop, further light, stop, further light. <clears throat> How do we handle each episode of our life that God says, stop, I want to reveal it to you more? Do we, for example, we may take it a misfortune mm. or a certain problem that the world has given us? Yes. Or can we trust him that he is trying to show more of himself? The more we know him, the better it is. I remember a story, a tourist had gone into the jungles of Africa and he was going for a particular destination. He did not know how to get there, but he had a guide who was going through all these bushes and cutting down and chopping down. So he said, how do you know where to go? He said, I don't have to know the way. I am the way. Mm. So maybe we're trying to find ways. But to know God, we will know how he is the way. That's why Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. Yes. So we have to come to know him. Sometimes I ask myself, do I really know him? In every situation and circumstance in my life, can I trust him? That's where God said, listen, I'm training you to know me for what? For the final showdown. Yes. It is so important that we know it, otherwise we're going to fail in the final showdown. showdown. Okay, so now we go to the next heading, the lessons of faith in God's providence. 
in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 7 says, And it happened after a while that the brook dried up. When all is well and favorable, we think our faith is strong. Faith, however, never looks at circumstances, but always beyond them, straight at God. God arranges our circumstances for our real training so that we may have the opportunity to grow and exercise our faith for greater tests and challenges to come. Before standing face to face with the kingdom of Satan, our brook, uh, uh, the book, brook at our Cherith or Kerith will dry up. The previous resources of our Christian background will dry up so that we can be filled with something new. God is always training those who trust Him and submit to His discipline because He has called us for a great work according to His purpose. But the dry brook is not the end. You know, uh, when there was famine, according to Elijah's word, yes. three and a half years, everything was dried up. However, God told Elijah, go to the, the brook of Kerit. There was water flowing from that, going to the sea. Everywhere was <clears throat> dried, everywhere was famine. But that river was running. Now, Elijah was saying, thank God, everybody's suffering, I'm not. He has provided for me. And then God said, even that should dry up. Let me see, how do you know me? And that's a scary thing, Pastor. Very. Because we as humans always look to have a uh, fallback Very. option. And uh, in light of what he was facing with a famine of three and a half years, uh, a little stream of water was life-saving. And God purposely said, let that even dry up. So there's absolutely nothing that humanly can be done for our circumstance. It is only then that God steps in. Yeah, but what he does later on as we read, it's even more bizarre, okay. more strange, more unbelievable. But then that's where we have to believe that the, 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 the river is gone, stream is gone. God tells me something which I say it is not reasonable. But pastor, this is interesting. If the river had not dried up, yeah. Elijah most likely would have stayed. Yes at that brook, and he would have never gone to the next journey of his faith. So sometimes something in our life dries up, and we get panicked, we, we get scared, we say, well, what am I going to do? But maybe God is allowing that brook to dry up, because now he's going to lead us to a place where not only there is water, but there's also food. But, uh, but, but to us, it is unreasonable. Of course. Well, let's read it. All right, so next... We read in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 8 and 9, Then the word of the Lord came to him after the brook dried up. <laughs> Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. We have to know the condition of widows. The most destitute and desperate yes. people of the times. The most unlikely, unreasonable resource to feed Elijah. Poorest of poor. Poorest of poor. Our faith should not depend on circumstances, but on the sure foundation that God has commanded that the remnant be taken care of. He might use the most likely, unlikely see, means. We have to underline that. Unlikely. Yes. He might use the most unlikely means, but what matters is God has commanded. In all of the circumstances ordered by God, Elijah had to learn the lesson of God's providence and omnipotence Otherwise, later he would not be able to stand before a famine-stricken people and say, If the Lord be God, follow him. How can we possibly declare God as king of all our needs if his sovereign rule has not come into our own lives? If we are citizens of his kingdom, cannot depend on him in all circumstances of our lives, how can we convince others to do so? Elijah was taught two great lessons, that God was sovereign over material matter and that God was sovereign over human life. Once again, Elijah obeyed the Lord. Subsequently, he was placed in circumstances by which he could both advance his knowledge and deepen his experience of God. You know, easier said than done. Yes. I hope, 
I pray to God that if we are placed in circumstances like that, we would not fail. And uh, if we fail, God is gracious to give us another chance. You know, again, it, it comes down to knowing Him. Yes. Uh, John chapter 17 says, and this is eternal life, that you may know Him. John chapter 17 is a pivotal chapter. And John makes a point to tell us eternal life, eternal life that you talk about is to know him. And then if we look at the life of Paul, like Elijah, what did man go through to know more and more and more about God? But when he comes towards the end of his life, he says that I may know him. So eternal life is not a quantitative truth. It is a qualitative, qualitative truth, which is knowing God. So we go to the verse, uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 10 to 12. So he arose and went to Zarephath. By the way, footnote, pastor, when God told him to go to the brook of Kerith, it was towards east. Yes. Now he's telling him to go west. west. So uh, Elijah is crisscrossing yeah. the territory, but that's what God has said. Yeah. And when he came to the gates of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Then she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, and that we may eat it and die. <laughs> Edmund, I'm asking you a question. If we were placed in a situation like that and we got an answer like that, how would we react? We would look up and say, Lord, are you making fun of me? Is it real? But look at the life of Elijah. That's what made him Elijah. I guess Elijah knew the Lord so well that he wouldn't take these answers on, on surface at face value, and he, he, he insisted. Here was a woman about to die of hunger. Had God made a mistake in choosing her to feed Elijah? What an unlikely person to tend to God's prophet. Our natural response is one of, one of disbelief. Why not select a wealthy person so as not to torment this poor woman and her son who are about to die. Because the abundance of a rich believer would not, would not have glorified uh, and vindicated God who's about to feed a famine-stricken Israel. Rather, the poverty of this destitute widow proved that God was not only sovereign over man's spirit, but also over every circumstantial thing around him. He was omnipotent God, the omnipotent God who could feed a starving nation. Elijah was about to declare or proclaim such a divine king and such a blessed kingdom to an impoverished Israel. But before he could do so, he had to see it for himself. He had to receive a revelation of that particular attribute of God. Then he could preach the providence of God to Israel as the only alternative to Baal. This message was even was to even reach, reach King Ahab, who under the fam famishing dominion of Baal, was also searching for grass to feed his horses and mules. Israel in, this, in their desperation needed to return to Jehovah, who could meet all their needs. Elijah, despite, despite the apparent circumstances in which he found himself, did not doubt God, who had said, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. No, 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 here is an interesting question comes up. Yes. God told Elijah to go there. Yes. But he says, I have commanded a widow. Yes. Now the onus is on that widow. That's right. To obey God's command, or well, she says, I have only enough for me and my son to eat and die. Now God says, I have commanded her to feed you. Now here's come another strange 
phenomena of faith. And not only Elijah would have to trust that woman, that woman had to obey the word of God and the commandment of God to feed Elijah. And the thing is this, Pastor, in any ministry that relates to the word of God and the kingdom of God, there's always going to be two sides. Exactly. The vessel that needs to stand and the person who supports the work of God as this widow supported Elijah. Yeah. So the widow had to support and Elijah had to stand. Well, let's continue. He could have. Elijah, despite the... Uh, no, he could have. Yeah, I'm just going to read that again. Elijah, okay. despite the apparent circumstances in which he found himself, did not doubt God who had said, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. He could have resorted to other means and sources to satisfy his hunger and thirst. By so doing, he would have missed one of the greatest lessons of faith that he could ever learn, the enjoyment of God's providence. He knew God was God, and what he was about to witness was God in action, a demonstration of the sovereign God of Israel, the one whom Israel had forsaken for Baal. Here's a very interesting <clears throat> sentence. He knew God was God, and what he was about to witness was God in action. Oh yeah, we can say God is in heaven, sitting there, is omnipotent, is sovereign, but now God is acting. You know, this chapter that we began, what was the title? Title. Knowing, Knowing God's the character, character of God. Yes. God. It's an action that we find God's character of providence. So it's not about to know, to know about the character of God. It is to actually know no, God in, in his, his character. character. That's right. So uh, as, as he submitted to each further step of knowing God, his faith grew stronger and stronger for a tremendous task. Elijah did not fix his eyes on the widow or her, her limited resources, but on the God who could create something out of nothing. Mm. Praise the Lord. Elijah did not fall victim to his circumstances, but desiring to know God for a newer revelation and a stronger faith, he said, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 13 and 14, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterwards, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour not, uh, shall not. not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil dry, run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. What a promise by desiring to know God hmm. in a few revelations and stronger. This is what he said to that woman. I want to look at the, my, my brothers and sisters, myself. Can we pray this prayer to say, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you in your character. You're the greatest provider. Nothing can stop you. If we stand, if I stand on the ground of the remnant, you are never going to let me. Amen. The language of faith is thus says the Lord. The moment we lay hold of God's promises, it is the end of the reasoning of our, of our own unbelief. As someone very aptly said, unbelief puts circumstances between the soul and God. Faith puts God <laughs> between the soul and the circumstance. Made him make him center. On the other hand, the attitude of the widow was one of resignation to her circumstances and, and of surrender to death, that we may eat and die. Where there is unbelief, there is death. But where there is faith in God's promises, death is vanquished. The widow looked at the bin of flour, a nearly empty flask of oil, and said to herself, the end has come. There was no hope because she did not know Jehovah, or not know where as well. He, how could she, if the people of Israel, who were supposed to know and testify for him, had turned to Baal? But God is the God of all. If his own people had rejected him, did it mean that he could not reveal himself to the Gentiles? 
who were willing to co co cooperate with him for the manifestation of his kingdom? No. For before revealing himself to Israel in the power of his kingdom, he chose to reveal himself to the Gentiles. For this reason, in a reason in the context of God's kingdom, Jesus said to the Jews, Luke chapter 4, 24 to 26, But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three and a half, three and month, years and six months. And there was great famine throughout the land, but none of them uh, was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. <laughs> well, sometimes, as you said, we're trying to put God in a box. You know, this statement that Jesus <clears throat> made to the Jews infuriated Jews. Mm -hmm. If we read the whole chapter, they will try to kill him because of this statement. That's right. He said he sent them to the, to, to the Gentile, to a Gentile woman, to a poor Gentile widow who was about to die. Through him, through her, God demonstrated his character and nature. Oh, my God. If God's people reject his kingdom, he will reveal it to those who are not his people. Israel rejected Jehovah, therefore the widow of Zarephath, along with Elijah, were chosen to be the first in their own generation to see the kingdom of God in action. What a compliment. Can it be said about us? What an honor. Can we hope that it could be said about us in a situation where everything is going crazy? In a situation where so many thousands of people are dying because of a virus? Compared to many great organizations and perhaps uh, mega churches, we might be like a widow. There's not much that we have. But by faith, we place it in the hands of the messenger, which is the Holy Spirit and the truth that God has revealed to us. And that will be the source that it will never dry up. We will continuously come to know the Lord deeper and deeper and deeper. Isn't it that honor that this woman was remembered by Jesus? Yes. When Jesus names someone, that must be <laughs> very special. The widow's hope dependent, depended on a handful of flour and a little oil because she did not know Jehovah. How long would they last? What could God do with so little? The situation reminds us of disciples of Jesus when the time came to feed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. They asked, but what are these among so many? Gospel of John chapter 6 verse 9. This is the language of logic and reason. But the language of faith is, there is God among so many. And God is well able to do all things. Faith says, with men things are impossible, but with God all things are possible. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. The widow's attitude was one of self-preservation for me and my son. Her reason and logic asked, what should I give my meager, why should I give my meager stock to a man of God? However, she had to learn the lesson of denying self before she was able to see the glory of God. As she trusted the word of God, exercised her faith, and surrendered her all to the Lord, she and her son were delivered from dying in their selfishness. They also became eyewitnesses and participants in God's glory. They were able to see an outstanding miracle as she provided for a person who later on was to proclaim and demonstrate God's kingdom. So she found out that God was capable of taking care of her needs also. also if we give to God's word, if we give to God's work, He's able to provide for us. If we stand with the message yeah. who is brought by a messenger or messengers, it's not that we're supporting the messenger. It is the message that needs to supported. be supported. One of the lessons that sometimes we don't learn easily is to give up from our substance to God's work. Yes. Because if we give from our substance, the message goes out. And the Elijahs are preserved. The kingdoms are declared. And you said it very well. It is very easy for a rich person to yes. give out of their abundance. Yes. But as the widow of uh, Gospel of Luke, when she only had two mites... Yes. And she placed the two mites. She That's what counts. She supported God's word. The widow responded to God's claim on her handful of flour and a little oil so that it could be used for the furtherance of his kingdom. What resulted was that she and her son lived throughout the famine. They did not die 
as they had expected they would. But because she surrendered her all, they became the recipient of his kingdom blessing pronounced by God's remnant representative, Elijah. The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by Elijah. Are, uh, are these stories? Or they are real? They really happened. They really happened, because Jesus mentioned to this widow yes. of Zarephath. Can we sometimes in our very educated and sophisticated, sophisticated mindset, well, this is a story, this is not real. It can't happen today. It doesn't matter when. God was able to take care of his remnant no matter what the circumstances. Amen. Praise God for his word through the remnant. So the lessons of faith in God's resurrection. So it's learning God's character, learning yes. God's character, knowing, coming to know God that I may know him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. So Christ Elijah so far has learned a few lessons. He went to a dried up brook. God provided and there. Fed him. Ravens fed and then he came back. Now the widow of Zarephath is feeding him in the most unlikely circumstances. Well, now we go to the next lesson. There are tremendous lessons to be learned from the life of Elijah. As we continue studying the life of this blessed remnant man, we shall see how he was taught another important lesson which helped him know, uh, helped him know yet another attribute of God's character. He learned and experienced that Jehovah is the God who not only sustains life, but also the God who imparts life. He is a God of resurrection and has the power over death. To Elijah, Israel was spiritually dead and, deter and terminated because of their idolatry. But God of Israel, even in this kind of situation, could impart life. Israel could be resurrected. A remnant knows God as a God of resurrection. Jesus himself acted on this principle in the case of Lazarus. When they brought him the news that Lazarus was sick, knowing that he had already died, he plainly told his disciples, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, that you may believe. John chapter 11, verse 14. So that we, they may believe what? That God is the God of resurrection. First, the disciples, then Mary and Martha, and finally the Jews. All of them had expected Lazarus to be healed when he was sick. John 11, 21, 32, and 37. Jesus had to manifest to Israel that God is not only the preserver and the healer of life, but also the imparter of life. Elijah had also to tackle death before he could be ready for the ministry of ministries which had, was to declare the kingdom of God. So what we learn here, Edwin, a part of the nature and the character of God is that he is the importer of life. Sometimes I want to shout and sing because of this very character and nature of God. He is the God of resurrection. Mm. That's what Jesus mm. told Martha and Mary. I am the, the resurrection, resurrection and, and the life. life. When we come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not only the matter of our uh, sins being forgiven and being given an eternal life, which, which means knowing God. But it is that we come to know that he can resurrect the dead and give life. He is the God of resurrection. Everything he touches comes back to life. life. Once again, Elijah had to tackle death before he could re be ready for the ministry of ministries, which was to declare the kingdom of God. In what kind of God do we believe? Do we believe in a God who is weak and impotent in the face of death? Is the resurrection power of God an objective knowledge to us? Or is it a subjective experience? In other words, what sort of kingdom do we proclaim? Do we proclaim a kingdom whose king is sovereign and omnipotent over death? A kingdom which, uh, within which death does not exist? 
as citizens and proclaimers of the kingdom, we must reign over our circumstances. We must not justify our failures as being due to our circumstances. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17 and 18 says, Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? What, well, we, what a strange... What would uh, we do? That's my question. We would turn to God and say, This is my reward? This is... I want to talk of a real personal experience. Yes. I've been in the life of faith for over... 45 years. 45 years. There have been one or two circumstances when I turned to God, I said, is this my reward? Mm. Is this how you treat your servant? Is this how you treat your servant? Case in point, when your mom came down with cancer. Yes. And when I took her to the hospital, the doctor told me, there's no hope for her, she's die. She's dead. Well, who are you? What are you doing? I said, I'm a pastor. It was a she. She said, go and pray. That's and right. God gave her back in resurrection. It's exactly when I ask this question. What have I done? Is this my reward? But then I had to experience and see God in action. Not God only saved her. God only brought people in that hospital to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Her testimony was very Other powerful. Other situation, twice. <clears throat> so what am I saying? This woman had the right to turn to Elijah and say, Is this what you did to me? All I did for you? And now my son is dead. She and Elijah both had to come to see the power of God in resurrection. Pastor, it is uh, natural yes. for us to react that way. Yes. And I think uh, God as a father understands that sometimes we say things out of frustration that he doesn't put it to our account. He knows of course. how frail we are. He knows how scared we are. Of course. But God is a God of grace and second chances and God of revelation. And he reveals himself in that very critical moment. Even sometimes we cannot brag about mm. our faith. That's right. Because we may be put to the test that we see that we'll do exactly the thing that this woman did or I did. Is this my reward? Right. So if we really had the real faith, we would never ask that question. May God give us grace and maturity yes. that if things like that happen, we don't say that thing. But nevertheless, notice the woman's statement. Have you come to bring my sin to remembrance and kill my son? This shows her awareness of the relationship between sin and death. But God is not a killer. He is a savior. He came in the flesh in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, to settle the question of sin once and for all. Now, instead of being preoccupied with sin, which is the cause of death, we can be freed from it. Instead of worrying about sin and death, we can become preoccupied with God as our king and declare his kingdom. Elijah was not only representing God in his character as sin-hating, but also in his character as sin-bearing, sin-forgiving, and eventually life-imparting. Amen. Now was the time... For Elijah to put his knowledge of God as a life giver to practice. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 19 and 20, he, and he said to her, Give me your son. So he took him to the upper room where he was staying, and he laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow which with whom I lodged by killing her son. See, Elijah. Even Elijah is right now <laughs> having a hard time seeing the logic. Exactly. exactly. Elijah is also questioning. That's right. This woman fed me. Yeah. So what's going on? Uh -huh. why, why, why this game? Did Elijah really know God? Could be with his limited understanding and knowledge of God, go to Israel and proclaim. Could he 
with his limited understanding and knowledge of God, go to Israel and proclaim his about, kingdom? We're talking about the kingdom of God. That's right. Do we have all the knowledge necessary to stand behind the word, the kingdom of God, and declare it? And how dangerous it is if we uh, g get going and we, we start journeying into declaring the kingdom of God against greater powers and principalities without having these training periods and learning periods. Having had the experience of seeing. That's right. No, for he, like the disciples of Jesus, had to learn about the true character of God. He had to know more about him and experience more of him before he could be sent. So God placed him in, a circum in this circumstance of death where he could test God for himself and experience him as the Lord of life and the God of Amen. resurrection. Amen. And we come to the final passage here, which is in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 21 to 24. It says, And he stretched himself out on the child three times, cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. <laughs> then the woman said to Elijah, Now, huh. by this I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. What an experience Elijah had. What an experience that woman had. What a glorious scene. God manifested his true character as the sin-forgiving God and the one who imparts life to the dead. Moreover, Elijah was also vindicated as both a man of God and the true prophet of God with the word of the Lord in your mouth. The Lord trains us and puts his word in our mouth. It is not that we can memorize the word of God and say, it, repent, repent for the kingdom of God. Whereas we have to have experience and stand and say, I believe because I have experienced. And then not only we will believe, but people who are put in the circumstances of unbelief, circumstances of impossibilities, they also will come to see the power of God and the forgiveness of God, that God forgives our sins as we come to Him and then imparts life. Amen. In summary. I was reading something today about yes. a, a meditation. A man was saying that after I was saved, one morning, I sat down and I started to reminisce or remember all my sins. Hmm. So I started to say from the beginning, remember my sins one by one. I said, I bring it to the cross. I bring it to the cross. Then I remember the verse in the Bible that God said, your sins and your iniquity, I will, I will remember no more. no more. God does not keep a book with our sins in it. He had eradicated it. He does not remember it. He does not keep track. All of them on the cross of Calvary were finished and done. That's why he said, your sins and your iniquities, I will, I will remember no remember. more. And then imparts life. Amen. In summary, Elijah learned that God is not only a provider, but also the life giver. A question arises here. Had not the woman surrendered her all? Would she have seen God's providence and his power of resurrection. So let me read it again. Had not the woman surrendered her all, would she have seen God's providence and his power of resurrection? Would Elijah have been able to do any of the things he did? The answer is, she believed in the word of God, surrendered her all, and stood on the ground of resurrection for God's kingdom. So maybe we should underline each of these words. She believed, in surrendered, and stood. Surrendered her all. Believed in the word of God. We surrender only what we think we don't need or we may be able to negotiate with God. Yes. So, you know, this I don't need or if I lose it, it's not going to... It is like Saul who <clears throat> went to war and killed all the useless things. And kept the uh, animals. And good ones. And then in finding an excuse, he said, Oh, we brought them back to sacrifice for you. Yes. Consequently, Elijah succeeded in what he attempted. 
Had the woman refused to surrender her handful of flour and her almost empty jar of oil, she and her son would have definitely died. Moreover, she would not have had the opportunity to see and experience the resurrection power of God in her own life. It took Elijah three years and six months to learn the necessary lessons of faith in a living God. Now he was ready for his emergence in the first King chapter 18, which is considered one of the most glorious and powerful chapters in the Word of God. He was trained. Three and a half years. He says, Elijah, three and a half years, to learn necessary letters of faith in a living God. Mm. You know, when he stood before Ahab, Ahab, he said, the living God before whom I, I stand. stand. He knew God was living, but he had to learn the character and the nature of God. God. This takes us back to the statement of what the kingdom is. Back. Yes. Very important. In chapter 1, the very first, first page. Chapter you, well, page 12. Yes, you described that. Tell us in part rightly attributed three aspects to the kingdom. It is the sovereign rule of God. It is according to an order of things which takes its character from God. It is a realm where his order are freely, and the order, his order and nature are freely are expressed. Yes. Well, we finished the chapter, Pastor. Yes. And uh, by God's grace, next time we will continue now the uh, most exciting part chapter. of this uh, volume one, which is the encounter of Elijah with Ahab and his Jezebel, and uh, what happens at that time, and what a testimony. So, our uh, dear viewers and our friends and members of the Church on the Rock, we want to thank you for having spent this time with us. I hope that this material of chapter 13 was a blessing to you. And once again, I remind you that if you would like to receive a copy of this book, Breaking the Silence, either volume one or all three volumes, please write to us or contact us. You, will, you would see our email and our phone number, our website on the screen. Go there and order the book volume one or all three volumes and we'll be very happy to send it to you. I highly recommend that you get a copy of the book because as we're studying it you can read it with us and you'll have time to go back yourself and be able to read again and maybe underline areas that the Lord speaks to your heart directly and also our programs are archived in YouTube under the Church on the Rock. All our previous programs are archived there. We suggest that you go back and watch them again I think this is a material that requires not just once, but perhaps several times to go back and to listen, to watch, and to read, so that the Lord can find a place in our minds and our hearts to speak directly to us as to what should we be and what should we do to stand on the ground of a remnant and overcoming Christian in these last days and hours before the Lord Jesus returns. So we want to thank everyone, and along with Pastor Fred, we want to say thank you for being with us, and by God's grace, we shall see you next time. May you have a blessed day, a blessed week, until we see each other again. God bless you.